Uh, hey guys, Toby Mathis here with Jeff Webb, and you're watching Tax Tuesday. Not only are Jeff and I looking at you here, but we have Elliot, Dana, Dutch, Troy, Pio, and Ian, all of whom are tax professionals or legal professionals, here to answer your questions. Why do we do this? I don't know. Let's jump on in. Now, we do it because it's fun. We always say it's, we're bringing a tax education to the masses, right? So it's supposed to be fun, fast, and educational. So I want to make sure that we're giving something back. And you guys can always email in questions at taxtuesday at andersonadvisors.com. Uh, if you ever say, hey, where do I mail email in those questions? Uh, Patty or somebody will jump on and tell you exactly where. We'll also put it up on another screen. Um, if you need a detailed response to something, sometimes you're going to have to be a platinum client. Like if you're getting technical, otherwise we just answer your basic questions. We don't charge for it. It's hard enough to get answers these days and it's hard enough to get tax professional to give you an answer these days. Mm -hmm. They always like to say, well, it depends and uh, let me research it and how much is uh, the retainer. So we try to get rid of that stuff. Uh, you can give uh, immediate feedback on a question. Like you said, hey, I need clarification in the chat. If you have a question that you want answered, go into the question and answer. It says Q&A on your screen. There's two buttons there, chat and Q&A. Q&A will not disappear. If I ask you guys, for example, if I say, where are you sitting right now? What city and state? We're going to get hundreds of answers, just like, a, like shotgun data. So, hey, where are you sitting right now? What city and state? Let's see how good you guys are. Jeff is looking relaxed and well-rested. That's good. All right, so we have Dodge, Iowa, Round Rock, Texas, Washington, Rockport, Georgetown, Texas, just outside of Austin, right? Redwood City, Southeast Florida, Nashville, Queens, New York, Cold, San Diego, Where's Valley, Baltimore County, St. Louis, Los Angeles, Boston, Beaverton, Anacortes, yes, Concord, Diamond, Ohio, Dallas, Tampa, Ventura, stuff flying by really, really fast, Michigan, Iowa, so McKinney, Texas, so we have a little, people from all over the country always come on to these, and it's always fun. All right, let's dive into what are the questions we're going to ask today, because we'll be here all night otherwise. There was a Hope Mills, some North Carolina in the house. All right, if you have a solo 401k, can you lend money to a friend or third party as they are not disqualified person with no limitation like $50,000 limit if you're loaning to yourself? And what does the interest rate have to be? Can you make it a 1% interest rate or it has to at least be LIBOR or can it be whatever you want? So we'll go through that. I'm in Dallas, Texas. My parents have a primary home and a rental house. My parents want to gift me their rental house. They still owe $42,000 to the mortgage company. I just want to know what the best way to inherit the house is, how to, how to deal with the gift tax, or if there is anything I need to be aware of, what tax implications uh, do, I need, do I need to be aware of? How can I avoid the taxes if possible? Good question. So far, mm -hmm. we got a lot today. Can one circumvent, I'll put in quotes, circumvent the $16,000 maximum yearly gift tax exclusion by giving $16,000 to multiple persons who in turn also give $16,000 to the same single final recipient? I'll give you the look. That's the look. All right, we'll answer that one. When a beneficiary of a Roth who is not a spouse receives the Roth, is there a way for them to continue to receive tax-free income? that is generated from those Roth investments. What happens when the investments are sold? Is it different for a spouse? It gets complicated, but we'll answer that. I have invested in a multifamily apartment using my self-directed IRA. Will UBIT taxes be applicable when the sale happens? I am a passive investor and the sponsors have taken a debt of 75%. If UBIT is applicable, is there a way for me to avoid the UBIT by moving assets to a QRP? So really good question. That's a really good one, by the way, because it's not a straightforward answer. My wife has a dental practice that is a C-Corp. She wants to sell within the next four years and retire. Would she save money by changing from an S-Corp or from a C-Corp to an S-Corp? Um, if I have a manager managing two STR, single um, 
short term rentals. Short term, I am sick of always think single. Short term rentals, Airbnbs. And my wife and I are managing two long term rentals, LTRs, and we are materially involved at greater than 100 hours. Can we still depreciate the short term rental assets rapidly as one would uh, a long term rental? Thank you. I like to thank you at the end. I say thank you. You're welcome. If I have a charitable remainder unit trust, which owns a foreign corporation, which is the managing member of a US based LLC, which uses debt financing to flip bank paper for profit, with the profits paid to the foreign corporation, which in turn are distributed to the CRT as dividends, be considered unrelated business taxable income. Nothing like a little ubit in the in the afternoon, right? I'll need some coffee for that one. Everybody drink. I just got Coke. I have a cola product. You have a cola. Uh, my wife's from Columbia. Every time somebody says, I got some Coke. <laughs> it's horrible. That's just not even good. But okay. How will the new IRS rule on third-party payer apps such as Venmo, Zelle, et cetera, affect landlords who collect rental payments via a phone number or email that's linked to one bank account? The landlord presumably will receive a 1099K for all payments received, which will count as personal income. But the tax revenues, the taxable revenues split amongst multiple rental entities and not really personal income. What is the best way to handle this? Oh, boy. Good question. Bet you a lot of people didn't even realize that they were about to get 1099 from Venmo and Zelle and PayPal and even GoFundMe. My daughter is a U.S. citizen living abroad. She's planning to come back to live in the USA. If she will rent an apartment in her name, can I still pay her rent from my checking account? And if yes, any tax obligations? What about buying an apartment condo for her? I think there are three options. One, she put it in her name and I'll pay for it. Two, I will buy it in my name and later transfer it to her. Three, I will give her a cash gift of the amount necessary and she will buy it. I have to mention no loan mortgages involved. What is the best option or any other option available? Great question. Glad you're asking ahead of time rather than just doing something and then saying, what's the, <laughs> what's the result? All right. So really good questions, which we're going to answer. In the meantime, if you would be so kind, jump onto our YouTube channel. If you're already on YouTube, thank you. Just make sure you're subscribing. But if you want to go to aba.link YouTube, you can absolutely subscribe and then you'll get our replays. We break these down into bite-sized pieces and heck, you could go listen to some of the other ones that have already been posted. So you can always run around and say, I like Tax Tuesday. I wanna hear what questions they, they did. You can fast forward if you want. Usually we go over all the questions at the very beginning and then you'll see them. On YouTube, usually we're putting the, uh, the questions in the title. All right, if you have a solo 401k, can you lend money to a friend or third party as they are not a disqualified person. So we'll go over a disqualified person here in a second. Uh, like the $50,000 limit if you are loaning to yourself. And what does the interest rate have to be? Like you can't make it a 1% interest rate or does it have to be LIBOR or, or can it be whatever you want? Jeff. Uh, yes, you can <laughs> lend to third parties. Um, we're assuming that they're not gonna turn around and lend it back to you personally, but. Uh, just to get around the fifty thousand dollar rule, mm -hmm. uh, but let's assume you're, you're. This is a arm's length loan. Uh, you can do that. Uh, the interest rates are going to be based on the current AFR rates, the applicable federal rates. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're running <clears throat> between one and a half and two percent. Yeah. So. So AFR is the applicable federal rate. Is they're published what quarterly? Monthly. Monthly. Um, I would just go and say, what's the ethical AFR rate? Boom. And it will tell you a uh, short-term, mid-level, mid, mid -level and a long-term. I don't mm -hmm. know what the mid-level is, but they uh, will say basically based on the length of your loan, what's the minimum amount that you could charge friends, family, business partners, things like that. So that's what you would look at. I think they were below 2% for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you'd want to do if it's a related party. If it's, hey, I'm just loaning it out. You please don't do 2% because inflation is growing faster, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you're giving it to a friend, you might want to look at adjusting that interest rate since you're really losing money 
uh, the way that inflation is going right now. What is it? Six percent, something silly. Yes. So you probably want to charge something commensurate with what's going on in the world as appreciation. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot. And here's another thing: if you're lending out fifty, hundred thousand dollars, it may be to a friend, but I want to secure that debt. Yeah, make sure you have a deed of trust or a UCC if you're putting it against property. Yeah, but you know, there's, we always have a joke, right? Lawyer joke. There's no such thing as a, a loan between family members and friends. They're all gifts. <laughs> right? Because you're never going to get paid back. Right? Unless you want to make treat it like they're not your friend and, you know, and actually document it and make sure it's secured like Jeff says. Yeah, we, we don't want a situation where finances cause barriers between friends. Somebody said this, they, they gave $10,000 to their best to their, to their brother-in-law or loan $10,000 to their brother-in-law. So it was the best $10,000 I've ever spent. He's never talked to me since, <laughs> right? He's been, every time I go to a party, he disappears, mm -hmm. he, he hides from me. Yeah. Anyway, um, follow up. Can you loan to a family member? So uh, Richard, that'd be a disqualified party for the most part, unless it's like a sibling. This is what's weird. It's lineal descendant. So it's your parents, your grandparents, you can't loan to. Your kids or your kids' spouses or your kids, your grandkids, you can't loan to. You can loan to your uh, siblings, mm -hmm. cousins and things like that, I believe you could probably get to. Um, but otherwise, they're a disqualified party. It would be deemed a distribution if you did it. Yes. There we go. See, that's how you do it. You answer, you ask the question, are depreciation rules changing? No, no, no. no the, the bonus depreciation is still there. It's going to change, what, two years? 2023, I believe. Yeah, we're going to start to go down to 80% to 60%, 40% on, on down. But it, it, when it first came out, it was at 50% anyway, so. Yeah, they, they jumped it to the 100%, which they do periodically. They also played around with that. 179 deduction, which is on equipment. And they used to always used to always be at 25,000 until the end of the year. And it was always December and it was always the last week. And they would say, let's make it a million. And then they just ruined every accountant's Christmas. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, every, everybody's like, oh, we need to climb, oh, we need to close on this deal. Right. And you're like, oy, oy, oy. all right. I am from Dallas. All the accountants out there, you can feel the pain, right? Does, does Congress love to do it right before they leave for the year? They like to pass just a little low blow. Sucker, you're just at the very end of the year. Here, let me just pass this little tax thing just to just to annoy all the accountants, right? It's like a little, it's like coal in your stocking. I'm from Dallas, Texas. My parents have a primary home and a rental house. My parents want to gift me their rental house. They still owe $42,000 to the mortgage company. I just want to know what is the best way to inherit this house and how to deal with gift tax or if there's anything I need to be aware of. What tax implications do I need to be aware of? How can I avoid the taxes if possible? Sure. Uh, I believe if you're gifted an encumbered property that is a property that has a loan on it, uh, I believe it decreases the amount of the gift. It's, yeah, if they still are <clears throat> obligated. On right. Um, so I think first off, I would see if I could just take over the loan if I was not able to pay off the loan. If the parents continue to pay it, I believe that then that would be considered a gift. Yes. But the part that bugs me here is let's go over what happens if you do nothing. Mom and dad have a rental house. Let's say they pay 200,000 for it. Let's say it's worth 300,000. Mm -hmm. When mom and dad pass away, basis of that, house steps up to 300,000. So if you inherit it, you would get an asset with no tax liability whatsoever, assuming there's no inheritance taxes or estate taxes triggered. If it's in Texas, I believe that you're looking at, you'd have to be well over, uh, I think it's $12 million per spouse. So you'd have to be over $24 million of estate before you're looking at an estate tax. So there's no inheritance tax. So you'd be getting a stepped up basis on that asset for 300,000, you could sell it the next day and you'd pay no tax. If mom and dad gift it to you, then let's say that it's a $300,000 property and they gift you, you get their basis. You now have a $200,000 
property. I'm not even dealing with the mortgage on this, but you'd have the basis of 200,000. If same scenario, they passed away and, and you sold it, you would have $100,000 of uh, capital gain. In addition, if it was a rental house, you'd also have depreciation recapture, depending on how long they held it. So if this is me, I'm not gifting it or anything. I am saying, hey, mom and dad, if you want to gift me money, that's great. If you want to gift me the property, maybe I buy it from you and maybe we work on something. But um, I, I do want to make sure that we're, we're even there, now the parents have recapture and capital gains, maybe buy it on an installment note and spread it out. But like the only way to really win this is literally to do nothing. My opinion. What do you think? Uh, I, I'm just thinking of if, if the parents just really want to get rid of the property, they're tired of renting. Mm -hmm. um, I think I may choose to ship, sell it on the open market instead. They still have recapturing capital gains. If they want to give it to you and they want you to, I would probably do a, a long-term purchase to spread out the capital gains and everything over a longer period of time and have them gift you the money. Or if you're going to make it into a rental, they could gift you money and you could be paying it out of the rental income too. Like again, um, I just, the only way to, to, to make it as pain, painless as possible is really just to let life do its course and for them to keep it and, when they pass the risk is obviously if something happens to mom and dad and they have liabilities let's say they have a whole bunch of medical bills or 10 years from now they have catastrophic financials or something and the house that more that rental is part of their estate and they take it right so what if we, we go with your scenario what about having the adult child as a property manager so kind of taking the load off of the parents, making some money on it. And still available to the parents' creditors. Yep. Still not yours. Still, if they sell it, there's taxable event. But in the event that they pass, um, you still get the step up. Somebody says, what about transferring the property to an LLC? It, that's a good idea. If it's a rental property, it should be in an LLC already. If it's not, you'd put it in the LLC, but it wouldn't make a, a difference for the tax considerations. So, and, you know, other considerations to think about, like if I'm going to make it my primary residence and what they're doing is they're gifting me the home, I may not be worried about the tax because I'm not going to sell it. Like if mom and dad die, I lose the step up in basis. So I'm going to lose um, a step up. Let's see. I just walked through this in Los Angeles County, a step up basis worked for a sale in 2021, but the time from death of owner and the actual sale there was a huge increase in the parents' tax value versus what the step-up basis was. I had to pay three months difference in taxes. Thanks, Los Angeles County. <laughs> well, you got a nice property with the step-up in basis. Uh, I am able to pay off the house for my parents. Should I do that? That's actually a really good question. Um, if you wanted to do that, you, I, I would buy it from them. Maybe go to the lowest end of the purchase spectrum, like say what's the range of value and buy it as low as possible. So there's as little taxable event to them mm -hmm. as humanly possible, but just know, like you're just, you're giving up the step up in basis. Mom and dad die, whatever that step up is, is what you're giving up. So, and you're going to, any taxes that are paid in the meantime, even if it's spread out over a period of time is, is lot is, is sunk money. So if, if you're going to keep the house, um, Somebody says, what is step up in basis? Step up in basis is this. If I paid $200,000 for the house and it's worth $300,000, when parents die, the new basis, the what you paid for the house is now $300,000. It steps up to the fair market value. So if it's sold for $300,000, there's zero gain. If mom and dad had sold it the day before they passed away, they would have had gain of at least $100,000, the difference between two hundred dollars and the and the hundred plus depreciation recapture because it was a rental property. Mm -hmm. So the only way I would look at this is if you're going to live in it and it's going to be your primary residence or something, are you just going to keep it forever? Have them gift it to you if they don't want the money. Hey, I want to give this to you. You'd have to deal with the 42,000. Maybe you're going to pay off the 42,000 yourself. 
So they have a ton of gift that they can give you. They have, again, $24 million that they can gift you during their lifetime. So I think that you're going to be just fine. You'd have to fill up uh, or fill out a gift tax return, which would probably require a, an appraisal of the property. Uh, but then it's your property. You don't have to worry about it anymore. If you're not going to sell it, who cares? Right. Then, you know, then you just make sure you don't sell it at some point in the future. Maybe you give it to your children or you pass away and the basis steps up. Still works that way. But when you gift, you get the basis of the gift. Right. Correct. There's no step up of gifts. Right. Uh, Yeah. They just want to gift it to me, but it's the mortgage. Should I pay off the mortgage first? Well, I, I would pay it off in conjunction with the gift. Right. Right. So unless you want to make a gift to them. Right. Otherwise it's a separate right. gift it's a to separate them. Gift. Yeah. Then you're going to be annoyed because you're going to be like, I have to do a gift of 42,000 and just do it all at one time. Hey, we're going to transfer. And at the time, put $42,000 in escrow, pay it off. You get the house at their basis. Make sure you're tracking that. No taxes will be due except the transfer tax. You're a winner. All you do is you fill out your uh, gift tax return, which mm-hmm. is, which one is that? 709. A 709. And as long as you're not selling it, you're going to keep it, Cam? You're going to keep it? Yes. That's what I would do. Free advice on the internet. What could go wrong? <laughs> Just kidding. That's actually pretty solid. You might want to bounce that off of somebody else, but that's, I think that's very very solid advice. There's a caveat at the bottom of the screen that's so tiny you can't read it. (laughs) I always see those guys that are giving out financial advice on the radio, but I'm always like, you must get sued. (laughs) You have to do it. (laughs) Uh, Should I have a CPA uh, help me do the gift? Uh, Yeah, because one of the things you may want to consider is if you're going to pay off the $42,000, you may want to loan your parents money long enough for them to pay it off and then just get it back from them. Yeah, you could do that too. Loan them. Um, just document it. And uh, you can reach out to us. All right. Can one circumvent the $16,000 maximum yearly gift tax exclusion by gifting $16,000 to multiple persons who in turn also give $16,000 to the same final recipient? I think I gave you the eye earlier jeff if you want to answer that while well, i give them the eye uh no you can't do this the second you said can i circumvent <laughs> then i'm like uh oh <laughs> no you can this is called uh you can call a step transaction a collapsible transaction meaning irs looks at what happened between between the beginning and the end Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're going to say, no, you, you actually made that gift yourself to that single recipient. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has actually already come up in court cases. You're not the first to try this. But here's the other one is, so what? You have $24 million you can give, or if you're single, you got $12 million you can give. File the flipping tax return. Hey, I'm using up my lifetime exclusion of $12 million. I'm going to give... Uh, multiple 16,000s. 16, 16,000, by the way, is the amount you give somebody without having to file the tax return. That's why that number, and that's 2022. It was 2015 last year, right? Correct. It was, it was 15,000 15, last year. Yes. Yeah, uh, and we were talking about this earlier that a lot of people get hung up on this annual gift exclusion. It is only what you can give, like you said, without mm-hmm. filing a tax, uh, a gift tax return to report it. And just because you file a gift tax return doesn't mean you're going to be paying any tax. Yep. You're not going to be paying anything. It's an exclusion. You're just keeping track. Like, hey, I can give away $12 million to people tax-free during my lifetime. Or I can give away a whole bunch of $16,000 to all sorts of different people as well. Like, I, it's just, but if I'm giving big chunks, they don't want you to give a million dollars away every year for 20 years and not have to pay tax on it. They're just saying like, Hey, 12 million, we'll let you, but you go like, somebody says, do I need to document a $16,000 gift? My dad gave me in cash this year. No. Last year you might have, you're going to, you went over the 15 unless it was dad and 
another party. And actually, you don't have to document it. Your dad has to document it. Well, that's a good one, too. It's it's the, the person giving the gift that's responsible for everything, not the person receiving the gift. Uh, no matter how much you give me, Toby, I never owe tax on that. Yeah, I can give I can give Jeff a lot of cash. <laughs> What's the most cash you've ever seen in one place? Uh, cash, cash, probably about two million dollars. Uh, and that was a payroll payroll for a med cruise when I was in the Marine Corps. <laughs> it, it, it was money to pay the Marines that were on board the ship. It was cash. It was cash. Oh my gosh. Somebody says, where does he document the gift? If it's 16,000 this year, you don't, he doesn't have to. If it's if it was last year, then you'd do a 709. Yes. It's a, a gift tax return. Are those pretty easy to fill out, by the way? Uh, if you're just giving cash, a uh, single person given to another person, they're not bad to fill out. No, they're pretty easy. They're just, you're just, they're just keeping track of how much is being used against the total amount. But if it's two people, like, again, think of it like this. Mom and dad, they could each give you 16000 mm -hmm. Uh Dad and brother each give you 16000 Dad, brother, sister, some other guy over here and another girl over here, they all give you 16000 Same thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it really depends on who gave you the gift, right? How many people gave you the gift? And, and that's usually my example. Me and my wife can give uh, 16000 each to each my son and his wife. Mm -hmm. So, well, actually, you could give sixteen thousand dollars each to your son, and sixteen thousand dollars each. Right. So we we could give them sixty four thousand dollars between the two of us to the two of them. You can you can be my dad. I don't gift them that much. I, I strike that. Right. All right. Did I did I goof up something? No, we got it. All right. When a bishop. <laughs> When a bishop, bishop of a Roth, yeah, what a bishop, what the heck? When a beneficiary of a Roth who is not a spouse receives the Roth, is there a way for them to continue to receive tax-free income that is generated from those Roth investments? What happens when the investments are sold? Is it different for a spouse? Uh, as far as investments being sold, there's no within the Roth. There's no. It doesn't matter. It's when the uh, Roth is distributed. Uh, so for a non-spousal inheritance, there's a couple different options. There's the five-year option. Uh, there's a 10-year option. Uh, but in both of those, you have to have the money out within the five or 10 years. Uh, the good thing is, is if the Roth has been in existence for at least five years, when you pull that money out, there's no taxes, there's no penalties, there's no age requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, this holds true for spouses also, but spouses have another option that they can turn that IRA, Roth, or traditional into their own. Yeah, they could do an inherited or they can do... They, they, they can do an inherited or a spousal. And they could do it off of their life expectancy, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, so this is a situation where I guess the Roth is, the, is, is going to somebody who is not a spouse. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's going to a child you can go 10 years and take distributions over 10 years without having any penalties and any tax on the earnings. If so long as the parent or whoever it is, the, 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 the decedent, assuming this is from a death, the decedent held, held it for five years. Mm -hmm. right? Otherwise I think you'd have another, you'd have a timing requirement. Uh, the timing requirement is five years total. So, so uh, if my a, mother established this Roth last year, mm -hmm. I would have to hold it another four years before right. I okay. could, uh, but I could still take the um, non-earnings portion out of it inside that five years. Yep. The other thing is if it's, they, they held it for five years, let's say they held it for 20 years and pass away, you could just take it all tax-free. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's nothing yep. that says you can't. You spread it out over the 10 years. And, and here's the funny thing about the Roths is, let's say uh, my mother established this Roth a year ago. Well, she had another Roth she established 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The clock starts with that very first Roth, not the one she's giving me. Right. So the clock runs, once you, once you have a Roth, the clock runs for all of your Roths, no matter when you start them. Yeah, somebody says, what happens if one borrows against their investment portfolio but never pays the loan back? Are there tax implications then? So 
if it's in the case of this question, Sam, then it, there is no loan against a Roth IRA. They're not allowed. Right. Or against any IRA. Uh, but if it's against something else, let's say that I borrowed against my stock portfolio, um, there's really no tax implication unless they have to sell my stock portfolio to pay it back, in which case I would have the capital gains that are from those, you know, from those investments. So stocks. Okay, there we go. So Sam, let's, so let's say, cause it's secured. So the, I borrow money, this is called a security backed line of credit. So I borrow money and let's say I had a million dollars in my, in my stock account of value at the time. So, you know, right now we're, we're doing this, we're doing them, you know, the S and P is up and down and sideways. So let's say that I borrow $500,000 and the stock market crashes mm -hmm. and goes down to 600 like my my account goes down to what's a good number seven hundred thousand dollars and the brokerage house says oh we're freaked out you need to sell some stock to pay back a portion of it well you know the maximum loan to value is 50 percent or something like that so you would have to sell in that particular scenario you're probably going to have a loss unless you've held that portfolio for a really long time. But let's just say you had a gain, All right, so I have some gain. I know they're capital gains, for sure. It's just because they're, they're two different transactions. I'm selling the asset to pay back the loan obligation. The monies I received is never taxable. The money that I'm using to pay off is not taxable. It's the, whatever I did to create the money yep. is taxable. So I could just put more cash into that account in theory too. Like I could contribute to another 401k, roll it into my, portfolio if it's retirement money, or let's say it's not retirement money, it's just my stock account. I could just put more money in there so that the investment's larger. Like, you know, it's what old Buffett would say is when everybody's scared, be uh, be greedy. Maybe I should be going shopping because everything's on sale. There's a lot of folks that, that take that approach too. What else you got? Uh, my example is watch the last 10 minutes of the movie Trading Places when they do the equity call. <laughs> oh man, that was because they had margin. Vic, they had they were buying on margin. Oh, more, 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 more or something. Mortimer and yeah, the, and they the Dupla. Up, yeah. Oh my goodness. All right, hey guys, on Saturday, if you are a woman, you should go to the Infinity Women in Investing. Uh, it is absolutely free. You're going to see Patty Peary. You're going to see Nicole DeBrasio. Randolph. See, somebody's got Randolph. And Randolph. Warner. Randolph. All right. Um, so we are going to do a big invite to come out. You'll have Marquee Latimer. She took, uh, literally took 2000 bucks and turned it into over 2 million. I knew her at the time. Still know her, but it's been 20 something years. But I, I remember she took a thousand of her own dollars, 500 from her sister, 500 from her mom and blew it up. Um, but that's not what it's about. We're not going to be sitting there trying to show you how to make a million bucks in a, in a, in a year. We're going to show you how to build up an actual portfolio that, that pays you out forever. That's what we call it infinity. So you're going to learn to have an infinite income source. Pia is going to be on Patty's going to be on. You might have some other special guests, uh, but it is all about women in investing we don't exclude men, but we give you the weird eye. Like this is the eye that we give you. No, actually, if you wanted to show up, that's great. If you have kids, uh, you send your daughters, send your friends, and uh, send your spouse, and whomever, if they want to learn how to build up a uh, investment portfolio. They do a really good job. It's both stocks, um, everything from uh, options to uh, securities to real estate. We're not talking about risky stuff either. We're never the buyer of options. We tend to always be the seller because we want to be the casino. Uh, we don't want to be the gambler. So it looks like it's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Please register if you haven't done so. And if you think of anybody that would like to, it's absolutely free. The more the merrier it's going to be. We already have well over 4,000 folks registered. It's going to be a big one. And uh, we love that type of stuff. So if you, if you haven't experience the infinity side. Uh, we're really proud of it because people do really well in there. Um, it's free service. There are some paid components if you ever go that route, but for the most part, you can learn the basics uh, and be really doing a good job, uh, even for young people. 
uh, without a dollar out of your pocket. So if you want to come out, spend a day, do so. All right. This is a fun one. I have invested in a multifamily apartment using my self-directed IRA. Will you be, taxes be applicable when the sale happens? I am a passive investor and the sponsors have taken on or taken a debt of 75%. If UBIT is applicable, is there a way for me to avoid the UBIT by moving assets to a QRP? Um, so it's not UBIT, it's UDIF or UDFI, Unrelated Debt Financing Income. Yep. Um, so you can't leverage an IRA uh, by using debt. What happens is- well, and, you could do it. Well, you could do it, but- You have to pay tax on it. So 75% of your income in this case is gonna be subject to this UDIF. Uh, and it's gonna be taxed at uh, the brackets for, uh, Nonprofits, the 990T is the form. Um, also, when you sell it, uh, that sale will also be subject to UDIF. Mm -hmm. um, the gain. The gain. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, it will be limited to the 20%, and rather than the possible third, UDIF can go up to 37%. We, we see this a lot where people go out and they'll do the uh, self directed IRA and nobody explains to them that unrelated debt finance income or UDFI mm -hmm. is something they have to be aware of. And they'll go out and they'll buy a private placement and the private placement will say, Hey, we're going to raise 2 million and we're going to turn it into 10. So we could go buy this big in, you know, buy this apartment building, fix it up, sell it. And we're going to exit. We're all going to make, you know, another $10 million and everybody's excited. It just means that you're going to have to pay tax on whatever portion of that gain was attributable to debt. You can't do that in a self-directed IRA. You can do that in a 401k, a qualified yes. retirement plan. And there's no such thing as UDFI in the plan. You just can't have, uh, what is it? Uh, you can't be signed onto the debt, recourse debt. You, can, you have to avoid in both those situations. I don't know a way mm -hmm. to unring this bell because there's a prohibition against transferring assets, period, into a qualified plan that has debt on it, period. Like, I don't know a way around that. Uh, you would have to have enough cash in the plan to pay off this debt. Um, yeah, this is, it sounds like this is a huge amount. Other than that, I market's hot. I, I might just bail on the real estate, go ahead and, eat the tax and well I, I think you just wait and when the, when it comes out you're going to have a portion of it that's uh taxable that's all but they're also having a portion that's taxable every year if it's generating income yeah but if they sell they're talking about if they sell the asset um when the sale happens oh well that's what i mean i i think uh, so they're they're having udfi no matter what but when correct. they sell they're going to have it on the gain and you're going to have a like the majority of the money is probably going to be taxable, mm -hmm. which is not what you anticipated. I know it's taxable, but it's still in your plan. That's the good news, right? right. The plan pays the tax. What, what's the rate on UDFI? Is it uh, for uh, it if it was rental income or something like that? It'd be thirty-seven percent. So the capital gain would be twenty percent. So you're going to get hit with it, up to thirty-seven percent. Yeah, but you're going to get hit with it, but it's still inside your plan. So that's the good news. And then you'll get taxed again when, when you withdraw what's left. Annoying, which is why, like, I like self directed IRAs for some things, but real estate ain't one of them. Uh, I tend to say in our firm, we're always talking about you want, I don't want the custodian to have to sign off and everything. They'll do a checkbook LLC. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, like, oh, there's a checkbook IRA. And then it's still flowing in. People will still go out and do the exact same thing. The, the, the bad things that we see is people will sign on a note, boom, it's a, it's a distribution. They get debt, boom, UDFI. Nobody ever tells them. And, uh, or they run a business. Hey, I'm going to run a business. You know, the, the, the old example the IRS gives is, hey, you buy the, a tree farm, right? You just, it's mm -hmm. going to grow trees and people come and cut the trees. Then you say, we should run the tree farm. And that becomes <laughs> UBIT, right? As soon as it becomes an active business, it's, it's going to be taxable. So we, we tend to be like, hey, let's not do these things over here. Let's make sure that we're moving them into the appropriate vehicle. 
Uh, and there are ways to make those things work. Uh, somebody says, I didn't ask the question, but I researched this and decided to do it anyway. You can't do bonus depreciation, but you could take straight line depreciation so you get some deduction. Yes, absolutely. So what's, what's going on here is Benny's saying, when you have the income coming in, you treat it as though it's not sitting there in an IRA. Usually when you put money in an IRA, your basis is zero. When you have debt, you get to use your basis in that property and still take the depreciation. You don't get uh, 168K, you don't get bonus depreciation, but you get straight line depreciation, mm -hmm. which means you're probably not gonna be paying tax, but then when you sell, you're gonna have that little bit of recapture and capital gain. Right. So uh, the better route, if you're gonna do real estate, and especially if you're doing private placements, do a solo 401k. You'll be the trustee, you don't have to have a custodian, and you'll avoid UDFI, not have to worry about it. That's one of the biggest differences right there. Plus, mom and dad each have a IRA and you're putting it into a private placement. Each one's doing a separate investment. You roll those into a 401k, one investment. You know, you don't have to have a custodian sign off on everything. Uh, do you pay you, you bid if you take a non-recourse loan in your 401k. No, it's, it's, it's not actually you, but it's, it's UDFI. Enjoy, you don't have to pay it. All right, my wife has a dental practice. That is a C Corp. She wants to sell within four years and retire. Would she save money by changing from a C Corp to an S Corp? Mr. Webb. Uh, I, I kind of have mixed feelings on this. Um because this is most likely going to be an asset sale. Um, so if it's in an S corporation, you might get away with a little lower taxation on it. Uh, but something you brought up was the uh, built-in gains tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the tax on anything you sell. Uh, once you convert it from like a C corp to an S corp, if you sell any of your assets at the time of conversion, uh, within five years, mm -hmm. uh, it's subject to this built-in gains tax. Yeah, right before we were going on, we were going through the questions because we like to wait to the last second to look at these things. <laughs> no, I get to pick up that. I always go to Jeff and say, did you look at any of the questions? And he's like, what about this one? And then we're like, then we're like oh, crud. No, so yeah, whenever you convert. So like, let, let, me, let, me, let me back up here. What if they just sold the stock in the company? Somebody comes in and says, I want to buy your practice and I want to buy the company itself because I'm going to continue to run it under the name that it's under. Like, let's say it's, you know, Happy Smiles Dentistry. So if you sell your stock, it doesn't matter what it does you not are. matter one bit. You're selling your stock. It's 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 long term capital gains. They take all the liabilities. They take all the assets that's in there. You are you are fine as wine. Yep. But. When somebody buys your stock, they can't depreciate your stock. Nope. So that brings us to option number two. Option number two is I buy your company, but it has to be an S Corp and you get to treat it as an asset sale and I get to treat it as though, and I get to buy the whole company. That's called a 338H election. All it means is that we need to be an S Corp to do that. Option number three is you just make it into an S corp and you just sell the assets and there's no such thing. You know, can you keep your company? If you convert within five years of that sale or those, those asset sales, you're going to have built in gain. That's going to be taxable at the C corp level. I'm laughing because I, I knew what I was trying to say, but it was getting jumbled. <laughs> you're an accountant. <laughs> Uh, somebody says, if so, if single or uh, self directed IRAs are not good for real estate, uh, what is the investments are best to use for self directed IRAs? Anything where you don't have debt, yeah. I usually recommend if you want to get into real estate into in your IRA, roll it. You well, I have people who insist on staying with the IRA, and mm -hmm. you got to have enough cash in there to not only pay for the real estate. But all the expenses involved, maintenance and so forth. Notes. Uh, 
notes. Yeah, raw, like, like, like loan it to other, other people that are doing the real estate. Instead of investing in the real estate, just loan, say, give me a straight interest rate. Mm-hmm. If they think it's such a good idea, maybe they'll do it. Um, but anyway, I just went off. I'm looking back at this dental practice now. Sorry. I see questions that I can't help. But I'm like, gosh, that's a really good question. Um, so let's go over this real quick because mm-hmm. they're planning to sell within four years. I would be looking at making the conversion. You have to do the conversion of a C corp to an S corp. Generally speaking, within 75 days of, of, of the end of your, by the 15th day of the third month following the end of your tax year. So it's really March 15th mm-hmm. rather than counting up days and doing all this. It's really March 15th. You would have to make the election for this year. Just don't sell your assets for five years. Like write it down. Don't sell because if you do, I don't think there's a phase out. I think it's like a hard rule. Hey, it's back to the C corp again. Um, if you sell the company itself and the stock, then you don't have to care. Um, if you sell the company itself as the stock under 330 HK, you have to treat it as an asset sale. You do care. And uh, you really do want to have an accountant walking you through the sale because there's a huge difference between the non-compete portion, which could be ordinary income, the uh, goodwill, which could be uh, long-term capital gains, but part of it's attributed to you. That could be ordinary tax. It's 15-year depreciation for the buyer. Like so, they, they like they, they, there's all sorts of goofy stuff where they're trying to get an immediate deduction, and uh, you may be getting a ordinary tax treatment. So you want to make sure that you have somebody who knows what they're doing working with you on that, or you could have a real negative consequence. And I've seen deals blow up last minute over the fact that the lawyer drafting it never considered the tax obligations. And you're like, hey, you do, you're going to buy that company, huh? You know, you can't write any of that off, right? What? <laughs> you are just about to spend six million bucks. <laughs> You're like, uh, they didn't tell you that? No. And, you know. and too often we get a client will tell us that, oh, well, yeah, I sold my business. And we'll say, well, what did you sell? And then say, my business. And then, no, no. We need to know assets. what assets you sold and for how much. Right. And then whatever you decide isn't what the IRS is required to do. So if you said it's all equipment, they're going to look at you and go, no, a lot of this is uh, personal goodwill. A lot of it's business goodwill. Those two things are taxed completely differently. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's assets that you're going to be taxed as ordinary income on. Some of it's going to be long term. Some of it's going to be, you know, there's some capital assets. Some of the things, hey, I just, hey, I just took a, I bought a bunch of equipment in my uh, dental practice under 179, for example, wrote it off a couple of years ago, and now I sell the business and somebody else buys it. I'm having to recapture that all that money at my ordinary income tax level. So it's like. There's all these little gotchas. So when you sell the practice, the cleanest is to say, please just buy my company. If they don't want, then you better make sure you got a good account. Just tell them you promise there are no skeletons in your closet, in your dental closet. Sure. All right. There's no toothaches in that. No, that's a good one. Anyway. All right. I have a, this is a good question, by the way. I actually love these types of questions. If I have a manager managing, Two short-term rentals. So visualize, I have two properties that are Airbnbs. And my wife and I are managing two long-term rentals. We have two properties that are just little single families that we're renting out to people on a month to month or on an annual basis. And we are materially involved more than 100 hours. Can we still depreciate the short-term assets as we would a long-term rental asset? So can we take the Airbnb assets, these two houses over here, and depreciate them, accelerate the depreciation the same way we could with the long-term assets? Jeff. So if you have somebody else managing your short-term rentals, it's going to be more difficult. The 100-hour test isn't going to, probably not going to work for you. You're probably have to go to do the 500-hour test um, to say that you had 500 hours in your short-term rentals. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be considered passive income. Your losses are going to be limited, uh, how much you can take. Same way long-term rentals would be if you're passive in those. Uh, now, can I say what I would probably do? I think you would probably do the same thing. Yeah, you can absolutely. Um, you talked about accelerating the uh, expenses on the long-term rentals. So I'm supposing that perhaps you're a 
real estate professional. If that's the case, I don't rent out the short-term rentals in my name. I rent them to a C Corp that I own mm -hmm. uh, long. Uh, so they become long-term rentals to me. And then I let the C Corp do the Airbnb, the short-term rental, however they're doing it. Uh, and then you can, you can group those short-term rentals in with your long-term rentals and treat them all the same way. Mm -hmm. um, See, it gets weird. The way that the, so first off, we have to understand that if you're doing a, um, a rental business and you are going to be a, a real estate professional, you have to meet prong one, which is 750 hours, more than 50% of your time. And that's just on any business. That could be anything involving real estate construction, reconstruction, development, buying and selling real estate. It doesn't have to be yours. Then we go over here and we say, we're going to have all of our properties and we're going to treat them as one unit, all of our long-term rental properties. Mm -hmm. We're going to treat them as one unit. So all of our hours, me and a spouse combined get to be used on those. So long as we aggregate them together. The problem is, is if you have short-term rental property, it may not be considered rental property. If it's seven days or less, it's not rental property. It's just a regular business. And your time devoted to those do not count right. towards your, your material participation on all of it. So all of a sudden you go from being over hundred hours to possibly less than hundred hours. And you put in jeopardy your ability to take the, um, the depreciation mm -hmm. and loss against your other income. There's a few little caveats here. Generally speaking, when you're seven days or less, that's ordinary income, it's not rental income, but you still have to materially participate in it. You have a manager. So I can tell you that you're probably not materially participating on the short-term rentals by themselves, which means that would be ordinary passive loss. So that's passive loss that's not getting you anywhere. And you're like, oh, nuts, I can't use that against anything but passive income. So if you have other, the rental income is a lot from these other activities and it's positive, which I doubt because you're talking about depreciation and accelerating, then you could use that against that. So what Jeff is saying is we can't have those, we, we don't want those to remain short-term rentals on my tax return. So we need another tax preparer, I mean, another taxpayer, excuse me. So he sets up a corporation and the corporation becomes the host for those short-term rentals. And it's hiring the manager. It's doing all that stuff. And you're renting long. I'm going to take my two short-term rentals and make them into long-term rentals by renting them to the corporation on a month-to-month -month basis, annual basis, fill in the blank. Annually, I'm going to, you know, paid monthly. And I'm going to rent it at fair market rents. And that's going to make it another long-term rentals. So I just went from having two short-term and two long-term to having four long-term rentals. Right. And now I can add all my time together so that I can be a material participant in it. So if I am a real estate professional, I can now use that against all of my other type of income if I want. And I can accelerate the depreciation. I could do a cost segregation on all four properties, I can elect to accelerate my five-year, seven-year, 15-year property and write them all off in one year. I could leave them as B and just let, let them be five, seven, 15-year property. I could accelerate the 15-year property. I could do whatever I want, really. I have a lot of options. And the way you get there, what Jeff said is by crediting the other's taxpayer and then making sure that they're long. Yeah, the, the more I look at this, uh, in particular, a real estate professional also trying to do short-term rentals in their name, I see more and more conflict. I, I, it ends up conflicting on both sides. Because the, the weird thing is, and this is when you're seven days or less, it's not rental property. Right. You're a hotel. If you're eight to 30 days and you're providing substantial services, it's no longer a rental it's your hotel. 
if it's greater than 30 days and you're providing extraordinary services, like you're doing recovery or you're doing the, you know, a, a lose weight thing or whatever, and you're going out or you're doing something that's a three month program that the accommodations are just like an ancillary to the main thing that you're paying for, that's not considered rental. So just because you have a property and you say, I'm renting it, doesn't mean it's a rental. We always have to look at how many days, you know, the easy one is, hey, I just have a single family and I'm renting it out 30 days at a pop. You don't have to worry about it. But the, sh the short-term rentals, it gets a little money. Uh, oh, look at that. YouTube and podcasts and watching replays. So you guys could absolutely go in. If you like this information, you want to come back and listen again, pop back in. And uh, by all means, pop in and, and watch it on YouTube. We, we, we podcast them too. You can put it on one and a half. So we go really fast. It's Corey's favorite thing. It's, he doesn't recognize my voice anymore. He's always listening to me talking really fast like that. All right. I have a charter remainder unit trust, which owns a foreign corporation, which is the managing member of a US-based LLC, which uses debt financing to flip bank paper for profit. You followed that, you're, you get an A plus right now. With the profits paid to the foreign corporation, which in turn are distributed to the CRT as dividends be considered unrelated business taxable income. And hmm. hmm, I know we've talked about this a lot, uh, dividends are not considered uh, unrelated business income. Yep. UBI. So, um, there is a very narrow, very, very narrow exclusion that we're not going to even talk about that has deals with ins foreign insurance companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, if you're receiving dividends, they're not going to be considered UBIT. Mm -hmm. That's generally the rule. The only thing that would bother me is here is depending on what your involvement is. And it sounds like the foreign corporation runs everything, the U.S.-based LLC. I'm not certain if there are rules for you if you're participating in it. I don't know of any that would trip you up. But generally speaking, um, you don't have anything to worry about so long as because the corporation in theory is paying tax on it because dividends aren't deductible to the corp. So you're getting it, there's a taxable event. When you get the dividend, in theory, you're paying tax on a portion of it because as a unit trust, you're getting a payout, mm -hmm. generally speaking. You might be getting 7% a year that's gonna be taxable income to you. So you're not escaping, um, you're not necessarily escaping taxation. So I don't see there being a trip up. No. So really funky question was that one. All right. How will the new IRS rule on third-party payer apps, such as Venmo, Zelle, et cetera, affect landlords who collect rental payments via a phone number or email that's linked to one bank account? The landlord presumably will receive a 1099K for all payments received, which will count as personal income. But the taxable revenues are split among multiple rental entities and not really a personal income. What would be the best way to handle this? Uh, if, if all of the properties are in your name directly, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just going to allocate them between the properties. If you have one party collecting from, for yourself, a partnership, an S corp, a corporation, whatever, um, then yeah, it's, it's going to be a little bit of an issue. And here's what I would do. You get a 1099 from Venmo for $10,000 you report that whole $10,000 on uh, wherever you need to, uh, probably most likely um, Schedule E, but then you re deduct part of that for what went to these other entities. Mm -hmm. So I would have $10,000 of uh, income from this 1099K, and then I would say uh, nominee to Jeff Webb PLLC, mm -hmm. uh, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, and reduce those 1099K payments to where they need to be. I'm wondering whether I believe you could probably designate a business as the recipient of the 1099K. 
uh, so that they're reporting all the income to like labs. I would use a holding company or something along those lines if you have a 1030 or a 1065. Otherwise, if it's going to you, what Jeff said is appropriate, you would just report it. Yeah, you're you're reporting this income anyway. Like regardless of whether you get a 1099, you're required to report the mm -hmm. income. 1099 is just Ben Moselle, PayPal, and all these others saying we gave him some money. Right. You know, it should be on his return. Then they look at your return and they say, we don't see the money. You know, so if Jeff gets a 1099 for me for 10K and he doesn't have it anywhere on his return, the IRS is going to say, we think you underreported $10,000 and they're going to hit you over the head. If he reports it to his return and then takes the expenses, like yeah. even this, I've seen this. I get a K1 erroneously made out to my name for my business or something mm -hmm. like that. Quite often, I will report that on my Schedule C as income and an expense for the exact same amount and right. send it over just so I never have to worry uh, about the IRS saying I didn't report it. And, and we're going to see property managers experience this very same thing. They're, they're actually already experiencing it as they are receiving payments on your behalf and this person's behalf and so forth. And they, in turn, issue 1099s out to all those people that they collect rents for. Uh, so, like you said, it's just an in and an out yeah. for reporting purposes. So, it depends on who they're reporting it to. So, if you're going to get something, and remember, it's only $600 or more that they're being required to send that out. Just because, can you believe it? There's people that don't report all their income. What? Yeah, landlords. I've, every time I meet somebody that says, well, I've been getting cash for, for five years and you're taking the depreciation. Yeah. Anybody ever looks at you, they're going to be like, I mean, that's criminal conduct. You know, I guess, like, I hate to say it, it sounds horrible, but you're literally evading taxes at that time. You're going to have a really tough time. Like they, they won't, you know, send you to the gulag or anything like that they'll usually come and hit you over the head and say, you got to report everything and nail you. But, uh, let's see. I don't know if somebody says that they're talking about Patty's last name. First period. Outside of my, family. All right. my daughter is a U.S. citizen living abroad. Mm. She's planning to come to live in the United States. So first off, congratulations. She's coming back to you. If she will rent an apartment in her name, can I still pay her rent for my checking account? And yes. Any tax obligations. So we'll hit that first. What about buying an apartment condo for her? I think there are three options. Actually, let's go to the first part of her question. Rather than read through the whole thing, this is a long one. Let's just talk about what if you rent a place? What are the tax obligations of you paying the rents for a child? Uh, there's no income tax obligation or obligation. It's but there is a gift tax obligation possibly. What if I go above $16,000 a year? Then we go back to what we were talking about earlier and we need to file that form 709. Yeah. Now here's the problem I have as a tax guy with paying things for kids. Your kids could be doing something for your business. So let's say that Jeff has a business on the outside. It may be rental properties, maybe you have a side gig, whatever it is. Maybe you have a consulting company, Jeff has a CPA firm, whatever. Rather than just give the daughter money, why don't you have your daughter do something and earn it? And then it's deductible to you and taxable to her. And the reason that's important is let's say that your rents are $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. If she earns the $1,000 a month, she would be underneath the standard deduction for tax. So if that's all the money she earned, she'd pay zero tax on it. Yep. You'd get to deduct it. You just covered her expenses. If you pay for it, you'd have to figure out your tax rate, but to pay the $12,000, if you don't get a deduction for it, you had to make probably close to $18,000 if you're a higher in income earner mm -hmm. down to, you know, at least probably 15,000, like it's going to cost you three to probably 10,000 bucks somewhere to make that money. If you're in California you're in the highest bracket, even more, right? To have $12,000 left in California, if you're in the highest bracket, you had to make 24,000 because you have 37 uh, federal and you have 13 state. So it's like, ugh. 
And no, it's not all deductible, right? You have a $10,000 limit on state and local taxes, right? Right. So yeah, you're getting crushed. Pay your kids. That's better. All right. Now let's drop down to, let's say that they have, they're, they're, they have a lot of money and we'd like to own a condo or something. So what about we buy an apartment condo for her, put it in her name and I'll pay for it. What do you think of that one? I, I mean, I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, it, it is going to generate a gift, a fairly sizable one that you're definitely going to have to file 709 on. It's a gift. You buy a property for her. It's her property now. It's her personal property. We're not talking, we're dealing with depreciation. And you're going to use it against your lifetime exclusion. Mm -hmm. So that's option number one. Number two, I'll buy it in my name and later, later transfer it to her. So, uh, I don't mind this one so much. Uh, if I later transfer to her, uh, I put, probably put it in, as part of my estate rather than just later transfer. As we were talking about earlier, yeah, it goes step up in basis. Deal, is yeah. That, yeah, the basis or the, all the appreciation is going to you. And if you give it to her, you're still dealing with the gift tax. You still have to get the appraisal, all that fun stuff. So you're much better off. You're better off for, for simplicity purpose is giving her cash to buy the property as opposed to buying the property and later gifting it to her because now you're going to have to get an appraisal. Uh, and I agree with that. Uh, but Assuming that you wait a year. Yeah. Going back to number two, though, um, I, I could see doing that, letting her live there rent free and just working on appreciation of property value. Yeah. Number three, I will give her the cash gift of the amount necessary and she will buy it. That's again, what I was just talking about with number yeah. one. Um, none of these are my favorite. I still think like you have them work for you and you borrow it. Or if it's me, you buy the property you can't really rent it to your kid. I suppose you could. And then you just gift them the money or you say, hey, you got to go out. It's, it's going to be around. It's going to be a circular issue. You're not going to get a tax benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. but at least you get the appreciation on the property. I had a buddy who did this for uh, his dad did this for him. And he bought the condo. And at the end of school, the condo would appreciate it. They made some money when they sold it. And he didn't have to pay rent. You know, yep. dad bought it for cash. And so not a bad scenario. Guys, we've reached the end. If you have any questions, by all means, uh, email them into us at taxtuesday at andersonadvisors.com. Visit us at andersonadvisors.com. Um, we do have a tax and asset protection event coming up. Uh, Patty, is it on the 12th? I believe it's on the 12th. So another tax and asset protection event if you want to learn about land trusts, LLCs, series LLCs, corporations and uh, depreciation of real estate, a bunch of real estate specific uh, administrative office, doing 168K, doing cost segregations, how they break down. Uh, again, absolutely free. Click on the link there, aba.link forward slash tap. And uh, we teach that on the 12th. Otherwise, uh, if you can this weekend, go to the Women in Investing and you'll have a lot of fun. It's the first time we've ever done that. That's through Infinity Investing. Again, Nicole DeBrasio, you have Pia Washington, you have Mark A. Latimer, and Patty, uh, who will all be there teaching all day. Is there anybody else, Patty, that's going to be there? Or did I just name everybody that will be there on Saturday? I don't want to forget somebody. You, Pia, Mark A., and Nicole, they are all there. They're all in the same room, breathing all over each other. So hopefully... You know, what could go wrong with all these people breathing all over each other? No, they're all, they're all good. Um, anyway, that'll be a lot of fun. Jeff, <laughs> thanks as always. Absolutely. Um, we love answering your questions, and these are kind of fun. I hope you realize that taxes don't have to be boring and that it's not always what you think. There's always these little funky things. Uh, it can a lot of be fun. Uh, you know, no one can actually copy these links, right? Can only take a screenshot. Thank you. <laughs> That sucks. You guys need to make sure that they can actually click on those links. Oh, uh, the things we learn about Zoom. Or maybe. No, they do on my end. Okay, we'll have to figure that one out. All right, guys. Uh, thanks again, and we will see you in two weeks.